Number 15. The Cursed Tomb Mummies and curses just seem to go hand in hand, so it should come as no surprise that our first terrifying deadly curse comes from the cursed tomb of Timur. As the story goes in 1396, Timur became the Great Khan and decided it was best to strike out on a bloody campaign to rival his late relative Genghis Khan, his great-grandfather by blood. And so, he tore through Persia and southern Russia, leaving no man standing. He destroyed whole cities and massacred most of the citizens therein, as evidenced in the sacking of Herat, the capital city of the Kartid dynasty. In Isfitsar, Timur cemented prisoners to the city walls, alive. And in Isfahan, the rebels killed Timur's tax collectors and some of his soldiers, so he revenged them by massacring around 100,000 to 200,000 of the city's citizens, placing their heads on 28 towers. This was to create terror and combat resistance as he continued to conquer the world. As he prepared to battle Delhi, Timur grew even more bloodthirsty. He killed 100,000 captives and, once the city had fallen and the remaining citizens attempted to form an uprising, he ordered a horrific massacre. It is said that the city reeked of the citizens' decomposing bodies which were left out for the birds while their heads were piled onto structures. His terror continued as he invaded Baghdad in 1401. There, he ordered each soldier to bring him two separate heads at the minimum. Once they'd slaughtered everyone, there were no more men to kill, so some soldiers killed prisoners they'd captured earlier, while others returned with their own wives' heads. His legacy left a 70,000-strong pyramid of human skulls in northern India, along with up to 17 million dead, according to some estimates. Needless to say, Timur was a bit of a nasty fellow, sadistic, egotistical, a smart strategist but legitimately evil. So when he passed away in 1405, it's none too shocking that a curse was laid over his tomb with the Guri Amir complex of Samar Khan, Uzbekistan. Quebec Khan's jade throne served as a cover for Timur's tomb. On it, inscribed in Arabic text, read the curse, When I arise from the grave, the world will tremble. And it did tremble in 1941 when Soviet archaeologist Mikhail Mikhailovich Gerasimov was sent by Stalin to excavate the tomb. The Uzbek elders revealed a book to Kuimov, which stated that the tomb of Timur should never be opened, otherwise a war could be provoked. Kuimov didn't listen to this warning and removed Timur's skull on June 21st. The very next day, Russia went to war with the Nazis. Hitler launched an attack called Operation Barbarossa, which made the world tremble indeed. It was the most expansive and vicious invasion of the Second World War. Millions of Soviet civilians and soldiers were lost to the invasion. When, finally, the Soviets gave way to their superstitions on December 20, 1942 and returned to Moore's remains to his tomb, adhering to Islamic burial rites, the Nazis' operation Winter Storm failed miserably in Stalingrad. Terrifying deadly curse or coincidence? You decide, or venture into the Mongols' tomb and let Timur's skull decide for you. Before we go any further, do you think curses are real? Let me know in the comments with a simple yes or no. My answer would be yes. Don't disturb the dead. You never know what's attached to them. It's a proven fact that generosity makes you a happier person. So if you're generous enough to like this video, then thank you. Number 14. The Tomb of Humeru While no fatalities have been ascribed to the Tomb of Humeru, there is most certainly a curse detailed on the High Priest's Tomb. With two false doors, this tomb is terrifying in and of itself, but its ancient curse is even creepier. It states, I shall seize his neck like that of a goose. If you don't mind having your neck wrung like a goose, visit the tomb and descend the stairway that leads into an open court with an underground chapel. Although the tomb wasn't completed, with its paintings and decor left unfinished, the costly entrance demonstrates how much the high priest meant to his pharaoh, fitted with limestone and apparently a terrifying deadly curse. Number 13. The Cursed Iceman Cometh Throwback to 1991. The Iceman, aka Etsy, was uncovered in the stretch of the Alps range between Italy and Austria. Little did those who excavated Etsy know, the old bat was cursed. The deadly curse killed seven people linked to his excavation over the next 13 years. While three of the deaths were natural, the remaining four were crazy violent. So much so that conspiracy theorists have suggested that the Iceman cursed those who dug up his old weather remains from their 5,300 year old haunting ground, only to pick them apart for their own amusement. Forensic pathologist Rainer Henn was the curse's first victim. After using his bare hands to place the Iceman in a body bag, he headed to a 1992 world conference to discuss the group's findings. On the way, he died in a car crash. The curse's second victim, Kurt Fritz, was the mountaineer who guided Hen to the Iceman. 
He swept away the ice and snow from the dead man's face. He was killed in an avalanche, the only one of his party to have met death that day. The third victim was behind the camera the day they uncovered the Iceman. A brain tumor killed him. Still don't believe in the curse? Well, maybe these next three will turn skeptics into believers. The man who found the Iceman, Helmut Simon, was missing for more than a week in 2004. When he was found, he was by a rescue team. Simon laid face down in a creek after falling 300 feet from a cliff to his death. The curse seemed to stalk even Simon's rescue team, as the team led Dieter Warneck died from a heart attack only an hour after Simon's funeral. Conrad Spindler, archaeologist and lead expert on the Iceman excavation, said of the purported curse, I think it's a load of rubbish. It's all a media hype. Next thing you'll be saying, I'll be next. And he was next. He passed away of complications from a chronic pre-existing condition of ALS. Lastly, the seventh victim of the curse was Tom Loy, a scientist who found human blood on the Iceman's weapons and clothing. In 2005, he passed away from a hereditary blood disease, a condition that was diagnosed the very year he began working on the Iceman. While many of these deaths are obviously natural, the curse still stands. In fact, the Iceman himself met with an untimely and violent death. He was killed by an arrow and had his skull bashed in. He was a victim too but the curse that hung over his mummified body for centuries has created many more in his wake. Number 12, The Curse of Superman. The Man of Steel, superhuman strength, super speed, super hearing, x-ray, and heat vision. Oh yeah, and the power of flight. This kryptonite dodging superhero may seem like the toughest around, so it may come as a surprise that this superhero is super cursed, or at least the stars who've played him are. The curse is said to have sprung from the artist, Joe Shuster, and the hero's creator, Jerry Siegel, who invented the comic book character for DC Comics. DC held all the rights for the superhero and paid Shuster and Siegel little for him. In failing to receive just compensation for their creation, the two are said to have possibly placed a curse on the character themselves. Those who have been part of the Superman series have been on the receiving end of some pretty terrifying misfortunes, particularly the leads in the TV series in the first Superman movies, George Reeves and Christopher Reeve, respectively. From 1952 to 1958, George Reeves starred in Adventures of Superman and, in 1959 at age 45, he committed suicide by shooting himself, although the circumstances have been disputed. Christopher Reeves starred in the films from 1978 to 1987. In 1995, he fell from his horse and became tragically paralyzed. He only lived nine years longer dying from a heart attack at age 52. Some even believe that JFK fell victim to this deadly curse. His staff had approved a Superman story to be released by DC Comics in April of 1964. In the episode, the hero highlights the physical fitness initiatives put forward by the president. This was shortly before the assassination of JFK. A number of actors have refused to play the Superman role because of this terrifying deadly curse. They don't want to be numbered amongst its subsequent victims. Number 11. The Kennedy Curse. Or maybe Kennedy had his own curse to contend with. He didn't have to go looking for Superman. The Kennedy Curse has killed off many Kennedys over the years, reaching way back to 1944. Most notably, JFK in 1963, and Bobby Kennedy, his brother, in 1968. Both assassinations are riddled with conspiracy theories, one of which is that they fell prey to the Kennedy Curse. But these two primary figures weren't the only Kennedys to have suffered from the curse. In 1944, Joseph P. Kennedy was killed in a plane explosion in England during World War II, while Kathleen Kennedy was also killed in the war in Belgium by sniper fire. In 1963, Jackie O. lost her son, Patrick Bevere Kennedy, due to a lung ailment after a premature birth. Ted Kennedy, another of the Kennedy brothers, resisted the curse's fatal grip not once, but twice. In 1964, he survived a plane crash that killed the pilot and one of his aides. He suffered a punctured lung, internal bleeding, a broken back, and fractured ribs, but managed to keep his life. In the second incident, he drove off a bridge in Chappaquiddick in 1969, killing his passenger Mary Jo Kropotny. He managed to survive, provoking even further conspiracy surrounding the Kennedy family. Most recently, in 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. was killed in a plane crash over the Atlantic Ocean, along with his wife and her sister. While these terrifying deaths may suggest a curse, the Kennedy curse isn't always deadly. It wreaks havoc in other ways, touching many in the family through various sinister means. Number 10. The Cursed Telephone Number How can a telephone number be terrifying or deadly? Its owner being spammed to death? 
A call coming from inside the house? Well, sure, why not? But this particular cursed phone number has a totally different attack mechanism. In the turn of the millennium, the number 088-888-8888 was first issued in Bulgaria by a Bulgarian mobile phone company called Mobiltel. It's been issued several times since, due to every single one of its owners meeting an untimely death. Three lives in total have been ended seemingly as a result of the cursed telephone number. Originally, the CEO of Mobiltel himself owned the number. Vladimir Grashnov died of cancer in 2001. That's when things got even weirder. Konstantin Dimitrov was the number's next recipient. Being a mafia boss, it's not a huge surprise that he was blown away by the curse. In 2003, he was fatally shot while eating out with a model. The next fateful death came at the tail end of more bullets. This victim was also a crooked character, allegedly a corrupt businessman heading up a drug empire. Konstantin Dishliev was passing by an Indian restaurant in Sofia in 2005 when he was fatally shot. Coincidence? Or the bad luck of a cursed phone number? In both Konstantin cases, the likely attackers were Russian operatives who were in the business of taking out their competition. However, the three deaths, happening all in odd years, two years apart, while all three men carried mobile phones with the same creepy number have led many to question whether the digits ultimately are the fault. Mobiltel has since taken the number out of circulation. A Mobiltel rep was asked about the cursed telephone number and replied, we have no comment to make. We won't discuss individual numbers. Their suspension of the number led some to believe that perhaps they know more than they're letting on. Number 9. The Björkatorp Runestone The great mystery of Sweden is an ancient rune. What is a rune? According to your old battered dictionary, it's any of the characters of certain ancient alphabets, as of a script used for writing the Germanic languages, especially of Scandinavia and Britain. It can also be defined as an aphorism, poem, or saying with mystical meaning or for use in casting a spell, the last of which seems to describe the Björkatorp runestone. This 14-foot monolith can be found in Blekinge, Sweden. Two other blank meniers are placed next to the rune, forming a stone circle. The Proto-Norse language casts the cursed in a warning on its face, which reads, I, master of the runes, conceal here runes of power. Incessantly plagued by maleficence, doomed to insidious death is he who breaks this monument. In layman's terms, this means the man that breaks this ruin will shortly meet his death. The opposite side of the stone indicates the prediction of perdition, or prophecy of destruction. This curse comes from the 6th or 7th century, and its symbols are similar to the Elder Fathark runes, which are the most ancient form of the runic alphabet. 2nd through 8th century Germanic tribes used this alphabet which contained 24 runes. The Björkatorp rune stone's purpose has been debated. Some scholars believe it is a marker of some kind. Others think that it served as a shrine to Odin, the Norse god. Still, others suggest that it may mark a border between the Danes and the Swedes. But the most popular theory is that the rune stone is a burial marker, either a memorial or marking a true gravesite. This may justify warning against the destruction of the stone. However, no human remains were ever uncovered from a 1914 excavation of the area. Setting the stone's purpose aside, the curse of the rune stone is local legend, starting with the terrifying death of a local man. He attempted to remove the stone from the land by piling wood around it in order to heat it enough to crack the stone by pouring cold water on it. The day was calm, still, not a breath of wind. But as the legend goes, once the man started the fire, a huge wind roared, blowing the flames toward the man. The fire around the Björkatorp runestone died, as did the man, once his hair was set on fire. The unfortunate victim of this curse died a painful death. Fortunately, no one has attempted to remove the stone since so there have been no additional victims of this curse. The rune remains standing to this day, a threat to all who suggest its removal or destruction. Number 8. The Omen The Omen was the brainchild of Robert Munger, who warned the film's producer Harvey Bernhard that the devil's greatest single weapon is to be invisible, and you're going to take off his cloak of invisibility to millions of people. This statement conceived a curse the likes of which no horror film has ever seen. The film's cast and crew were seemingly stalked by Satan, even before production began. One of the first victims of the curse was Gregory Peck, the film's star. Tragedy struck when his son killed himself two months prior to filming. But it didn't end there. 
Satan really didn't want Peck in the film, as he tried to scare the actor to death on his transatlantic flight to start filming. His plane was struck by lightning, setting the engine on fire and nearly crash landing the aircraft into the sea. A producer for the film, Mace Newfield, crossed the Atlantic a few days later and his flight was also struck by lightning. He too lived. Yikes. During production, Satan continued in his meddling. Among the first shots of the film was an aerial view of London. A plane was rented for the shot, but in the end the aircraft was switched by the rental company in order for the original plane to be used to transport some Japanese businessmen. The devil himself couldn't have predicted this switch, so the businessman's plane came crashing down, killing every single one of the innocent curse victims instantly. Onward, the curse continued as a stuntman was brutally attacked by trained Rottweilers in one of the film's most iconic scenes. The trainer attempted to call the pack off, but they continued to bite through the stuntman's thick padding and nearly killed him. Yet another animal attack killed Sidney Bamford, a tiger wrangler on set. Bamford hadn't secured the tigers properly, and one of the wild beasts launched at him, biting his face off. Needless to say, the curse was brutal and violent. It became even more violent when it failed to kill the film producer Newfield in his transatlantic flight. During filming, he was staying at the Hilton in London when the hotel exploded. However, Satan had failed, yet again, to take Newfield's life, and so, with help from the IRA, he blew up a London restaurant a few days later as Newfield was en route to it. Thwarted again by Hollywood producer. But perhaps the most ominous of the curse attacks occurred after the film was released on 6676. John Richardson, the film's special effects consultant, was the mastermind behind the Omen's bloody death scenes. In the film, one of the most gruesome scenes involved a plate of glass beheading Keith Jennings, a photographer. After the film was released, Richardson went on to film A Bridge Too Far in Holland. On Friday the 13th, a week after The Omen had been released, Richardson and Liz Moore, his assistant, were the victims of a head-on collision. Moore was decapitated by a wheel from the other vehicle, mirroring the Keith Jennings death scene. Richardson awoke from the tragic crash to find the kilometer marker Omen 666. The accident occurred at the 66.6 mile marker near Omen, Netherlands. Could the curse get any more terrifying? Number 7. The Cursed Musicians Ever heard of the 27 Club? Alright, well you're about to. The club refers to a league of musicians who've been cursed by the number 27. That is, they've all met their untimely deaths at this ripe young age. Who are the unwilling members of this club? Kurt Cobain, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, and Brian Jones, just to name a few. These musicians were generational voices, cultural icons, and defined what it means to be a rock star. They were also drug addicts, each dying from drug-related deaths at the age of 27. Kurt Cobain had attempted suicide prior to his death at 27. He'd overdosed in Rome in 1994. His wife, Courtney Love, found him unconscious with a toxic mix of rohypnol and champagne in his belly. He was revived at a local hospital and returned to Seattle. After this incident, and a second one where Cobain had locked himself in a room with a gun, Love arranged an intervention with those Cobain loved in order to address his drug use. Cobain eventually agreed to enter into a detox program, but in a short time he climbed over a six-foot fence to escape the rehab facility. He flew back to Seattle where, on April 8th, his body was found by an electrician. Cobain had shot himself in the face. He left a note addressing his imaginary friend Bada, declaring that he'd not felt the excitement of listening to, as well as creating music, along with really writing, for too many years now. His body was filled with Dezepam and heroin, and had been there for days. The prominent list of club members continues, with Joplin overdosing on heroin, Morrison likely overdosing as well, and found dead in the bathtub, Hendrix being asphyxiated by his own vomit, and Jones drowning in a pool. But the list of curse victims doesn't end there. The club has initiated 41 members, with its first victim dating back to 1892, when Alexander Levy, famed Brazilian musician, died mysteriously at the age of 27. The cause of death was undisclosed, but medical records show he had no prior illness. Further victims of the curse include ragtime musician Louis Chauvin, who died of neurosyphilitic sclerosis, the inventor of the blues, Robert Johnson, who is said to have sold his soul to the devil and, in return, was taken prematurely at 27, and more recently, Amy Winehouse, who died of alcohol poisoning after spending the night alone, allegedly watching YouTube videos of herself. The latest member to join the club is Zambian musician Lily Tembo. She passed away in September 2009 from gastritis and anemia. So, whether the curse takes its victims through a drug overdose, a soul sold to the devil, or your everyday natural causes, the 27 Club has claimed the lives of many. 
and may claim many more to come. Watch your backs, musical prodigies. Number 6. The Curse of Tutankhamun Our dear old Egyptian friend Tutankhamun had a curse or two to deliver his excavators. When his final resting place was opened in 1922 by Henry Carter, the archaeologist found the ancient tomb nearly intact, which seemed to be a miracle to him and Lorne Carnivon, the search's financial backer. That is, until the curse hit home. Lord Carnarvon was the curse's first victim. A few months after the tomb had been opened, he was taken to Cairo after suddenly falling ill. Several days later, he died of an unknown cause at the age of 57. His medical records suggest that a festering infection from an insect bite may be the cause of death. At his time of death, legend says that a power outage struck all of Cairo into darkness for a short while. Even more terrifying, thousands of miles away on Carnarvon's estate in England, his dog is said to have howled in agony and then dropped dead simultaneously, as reported by Carnarvon's son. To add to the curse's legitimacy, when Tutankhamun's mummy was unwrapped in 1925, his remains are said to have held evidence of the curse. A wound on the ancient emperor's left cheek was strategically positioned on the same spot as Carnarvon's insect bite. The curse continued to wreak havoc on those connected with the tomb's discovery. Seven years after its excavation, eleven people had been killed prematurely by unnatural causes. The curse continued to follow the Carnarvon family and his relations, killing off his personal secretary Richard Bethel, Bethel's father, and two of Carnarvon's relatives. Bethel is said to have been in perfect health and is believed to have been smothered to death in his sleep. Lord Westbury, Bethel's father, committed suicide by jumping off a building. His suicide note read, I really cannot stand any more horrors and hardly see what good I am going to do here, so I'm making my exit. The curse is said to have taken the lives of more than 20 others who were somehow linked to the tomb's excavation. Also making their exits were Edgar Steele, the handler of the tomb's artifacts at the British Museum, and Sir Ernest Wallace Budge, who was also responsible for displaying the artifacts at the museum's Department of Egyptian and Assyrian Antiquities. Nothing like an Egyptian curse to take down dozens of innocents. Number 5. The Hope Diamond Dating back to 1642, the Hope Diamond has spelt out misfortune for many of its owners. The 25.60mm by 21.78mm by 12mm diamond is a whopping 45.52 carats. Remarkable for its astounding beauty, clarity, color, and of course, its size. Perhaps its cursed history claims the title as its most wondrous detail. The blue faceted ovoid diamond, set in a 16 white diamond pendant, has an infamous past. Legend has it that a stealthy thief named Tarvernir stole the prominent jewel from its Indian origin. The diamond was said to be placed in the eye or on the forehead of a Hindu statue of the goddess Sita. After Tarvernir had sold the diamond, he traveled to Russia, presumably to steal more cursed jewels, where he was torn to shreds by wild dogs, a terrifyingly deadly way to go. The master jewel was later passed to King Louis XVI, who also met a horrifically violent death as he was beheaded alongside his wife, Queen Marie Antoinette, for high treason and crimes against the state. A number of other deaths have been associated with the diamond, including that of a Dutch jeweler who was tasked with recutting the diamond. The jeweler, Wilhelm Falls, was his son's victim in a murder-suicide. Greek merchant Simon Moncharides was also a previous owner of the Hope Diamond. With his wife and child in the car, he drove over a cliff and killed them all. These are just a handful of unfortunates who have been touched by death over the years due to this wretched curse. You can visit the Smithsonian Institute and take a gander at this inexplicable jewel. That is, unless you care to live another day. Number 4. Tecumseh, the Curse of the Dead Presidents The Tecumseh Curse has led to the demise of some of the most powerful men on Earth, that is, US presidents, elected in a decade year. Nearly every president that has been put into the Oval Office on a year ending in zero has had an untimely death, and often a gruesome one. The Tecumseh's curse is said to have originated from President Harrison's electoral run. Harrison was victorious at the 1811 Battle of Tippecanoe, winning over the Native American leader Tecumseh, who allegedly delivered this curse in response, running onto the slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Harrison was elected in the year 1840 and served as president for a grand total of one month after which he died from a cold. He'd given a speech in the rain, leading to a fatal infection. The assassinations of Lincoln, Garfield, McKinley, and Kennedy are all associated with the curse. Lincoln was elected in 1860, Garfield was elected in 1880, McKinley was elected in 1900, and Kennedy was elected in 1960. 
Additionally, Presidents Warren Harding, elected in 1920, and FDR, elected in 1940, both died in office, with Harding suffering a stroke and FDR a brain hemorrhage. The curse was broken by Reagan and George W. Bush, although Reagan just narrowly missed its vengeance as he, quite literally, dodged a bullet in the 1981 assassination attempt. Number 3. The Touch of Death Bruce and Brandon Lee, famed martial artists and film stars, both passed away unexpectedly from the purported curse of the Dim Mock, also known as the Touch of Death. In martial arts, the Dim Mock relates to a sequence of touching specific body parts, which is said to result in death. According to some, Bruce Lee died from his 1973 cerebral edema after falling victim to the so-called Touch of Death. Even more eerily, his son, Brandon Lee, died on the set of The Crow in 1993. He was accidentally shot to death by what was supposed to be a dummy cartridge from a prop gun. Unfortunately, the prop team had created their own dummy cartridges by pulling the bullets from live rounds, but one was not sorted properly, resulting in a fatal shot to Lee's abdomen. Number 2. The Curse of the Little Bastard James Dean infamously died in his Porsche Spider, which he'd nicknamed the Little Bastard. On September 30, 1955, at 5.45 p.m., the movie star and his icon became the first victim of the car's curse after suffering a broken neck in a head-on collision. The other car's driver, Donald Durnipseed, received minor injuries, while Dean's passenger, Rolf Walthrick, was thrown from the vehicle but lived. Dean was not so lucky, having been pinned inside the Porsche. This tragic event would have been deemed just that had the Porsche not become involved in several additional seemingly cursed deaths that occurred in the wreck's aftermath. George Barris, master car customizer, purchased the wrecked Porsche for $2,500. When it was being unloaded into Barris's garage, the wreck fell on one of the mechanics and broke both of his legs. While this incident in itself wasn't deadly, Barris felt it was ominous and so he followed the curse to parts sold from the vehicle. In October of 1956, two cars which were fitted with parts from the little bastard were racing at Pomona Fairgrounds. The curse came after the two physicians who raced these cars. William Eshrid and Troy McHenry. Eshrid's car was flipped during the race when it locked up spontaneously as he turned a corner. He survived, though he suffered serious injuries. McHenry was not so fortunate. The engine of the little bastard had been installed in his race car, and McHenry somehow lost control of the vehicle, hitting a tree and killing him. Further accidents related to the Porsche were said to have occurred until it disappeared in 1960. To this day, no one knows where the cursed bastard's remains have been laid to rest. Number 1. The Cursed Wedding If you're a fan of Game of Thrones, you might consider cursed weddings to be the norm. But as bloody as Thrones weddings can get, the real-life wedding of Maria Vittoria del Pozzo, the sixth princess de Cisterna, may just rival those fictional weddings. King Victor Emmanuel II of Italy was against his son's engagement from the start. When Prince Amadeo of Savoy proposed to Maria, he was met with outright opposition from his father, who believed the Duchess consort was beneath him because she wasn't of royal birth. The headstrong Prince Amadeo went against his father's wishes and married Maria anyway on May 30, 1867. The wedding day, however, did not go according to plan. To begin with, the woman who had been tasked with laying out Maria's wedding dress decided to hang herself in it instead. Thus, the princess had to rush to find another gown. Once the bridal party had taken care of that mishap, they set out for the church. On the way, the bridal procession led by the colonel was stalled as he dropped dead from sunstroke, falling off his horse. At the palace gates, another death delayed them. The gatekeeper was found in a pool of blood. The curse continued at the wedding feast, when the prince's best man promptly shot himself in the head in lieu of a toast. The couple decided to flee the curse, heading to a train station in order to leave town, but were, again, stalled by an internal brain hemorrhage that killed their marriage contractor. Shortly thereafter, the station master was stampeded to death after being pulled under the bridal carriage. Talk about carnage, that's six dead and counting. King Victor, perhaps superstitious after all this death, decided to call the wedding party back to the safety of the palace. Unfortunately, another of the wedding party, the Count of Castellon, was stampeded as well after being pulled under the wedding carriage. Though the wedding was over, the curse continued. Princess Maria and Prince Amadeo didn't even make it to their 10 year anniversary as Maria died at the ripe young age of 29 due to complications in childbirth.